Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is just about my favorite time of the year. Anybody want to guess why? Uh, you, you know me, Victoria. You said NCAA, and that is right. It is March Madness, right? It is an exciting time of year where sports fans, right, across the country plot out their bracket of who is going to go on to certain victory, who's going to be the best team that's out there, and I love it. And I've loved it ever since I was in college. That's the first time I ever did a bracket. And of course, now I have to do my heart bracket, which always has the Gators winning the national championship, right? But I, I have my head bracket I do now too, which is the one I actually submit and tell people about. But I love plotting out who's going to pull off the miracle. Who's going to win March Madness? Who's going to have all the upsets? Who's going to have that victory? And when I was in college, I was really good at it because the Florida Gators won back-to-back -back national championships and they got to realize that certain victory. And it felt amazing as they won that certain victory. The problem is this year, right? This year... I plotted my path to certain victory, and if anybody was watching the game last Sunday, well, this is what happened. Oral Roberts University. Anybody heard of Oral Roberts University before? This small Christian university in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that my mother-in-law happens to be an alumni of, by the way, they kind of stopped the Gators' victory. They pulled off the big upset. They pulled off the miracle. And if you were watching them last night, they almost did it to Arkansas last night, but at the last second, they missed a shot, and they got upset. But if you've been reading the, the, the headlines all week, Oral Roberts University has a motto that's all over their basketball arena. Anybody know what their motto is or seen these headlines? If you look at their uh, basketball arena, that's their basketball arena in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's expect a miracle. Expect a miracle. And they were saying, you know, look at this team from Tulsa, Oklahoma, this small Christian school. Expect a miracle. They made it to the Sweet 16. They were all set to have that sure and certain victory. You know, I love March Madness because sometimes our teams get those miracles. And sometimes our teams get upset and our bracket is busted. And it's not fun to have a busted bracket. And I start off with that because I think March Madness is very similar to Palm Sunday. You see, on Palm Sunday, everybody's getting together and they've got their brackets set. They're expecting a miracle. They're expecting Jesus to come and bring about sure and certain victory. Right? Palm Sunday, the crowds, they come out and they meet Jesus. They grab their palm fronds and they wave them up and down and they say, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the Son of David. They know that Jesus is coming in and he's going to be victorious. That's what those palm fronds represented. In the ancient world, they would wave palm fronds when they were welcoming in a victorious king. And there are people's histories, just, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 years earlier, the Maccabean Revolt happened, and their people came in and they threw out the Greeks, and they welcomed in Judas Maccabeus as they waved these palm fronds of victory, that their king was coming in victory. As they came out to meet Jesus, their brackets were set they knew that Jesus was going to be the one that was going to bring them victory. That Jesus was the one that was going to give them the miracle that they could expect. The problem is, if you actually look at the text in John, what victory did they expect? What were they expecting Jesus to do? Some of them, I think, were expecting a great political victory. Right? They, they pulled out their palm fronds like, like many had done before, the years before when they had overthrown the, the Greeks and driven them out. 
And they were waving their palm fronds, expecting Jesus to overthrow the Romans and bring great political victory to God's people. I think sometimes we expect that too. Sometimes in our life when we say, you know what, I know Jesus is victorious, I know Jesus is reigning supreme, but I need him to give me this victory to solve this problem. So I need this person or that person to be elected to this certain office. And Jesus, I know there can be a miracle here. Jesus, I know you can be behind this political victory. And Jesus, I need you to make it so that that person becomes victorious because then my life will be better. Then I'll have that miracle that I need in my life. And Jesus, this is how I need you to act. But what happens when that person loses that election? What happens when that person doesn't make it to that certain victory that you were certain Jesus was going to give them? Where's the miracle now? How is Jesus working in that situation? On Palm Sunday, I think some people were going to be a little bit disappointed by the end of the week when Jesus didn't come in with a a spear and a sword to overthrow the Romans, but came in riding on a donkey. Others that were there, they, they were expecting a miracle, right? They were expecting to bring, uh, for Jesus to bring them a certain type of victory, right? John tells us here, the crowd had been with him when he called Lazarus out from the dead, and they continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard that he had done this sign. So why is everybody there waving the palm fronds? They heard about the miracle. They heard that Jesus himself had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they were there maybe thinking he was the Messiah, maybe wanting and expecting a miracle to come, and I I think we're very similar the same way. I think we all have problems in our life. There's sometimes when our life feels like it's a busted bracket, when things aren't going to plan, and we, we tell Jesus, we say, Jesus, I need this miracle. Jesus, I need you to get me into this drug trial. Jesus, I I need you to to fix my relational problem that I'm having with my son. Jesus, I need you to get me that promotion so that I can make even more money. Jesus, I need this miracle, and I need you to do this for me, Jesus. And while it's not bad to ask Jesus for things when we're in times of need, when we expect him to act on our terms, though, and we begin to think that we know more than Jesus, that becomes a problem. The crowds there, they they were expecting a miracle, but I wonder how many of them thought it was on their terms. The religious leaders were there too. They were expecting a victory, right? They didn't want anything to do with Jesus. They didn't like Jesus, right? So the religious leaders were there, and this is what John tells us about the religious leaders. He says, so the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Those who had power, those who were victorious in life, so to speak, they didn't like all the followers that Jesus was getting, so they wanted to develop a plan on their own to put Lazarus, the man whom Jesus raised from the dead, they wanted to put him to death so that they could find victory and their life. And I wonder how many times that happens to us. How many times when we don't want to follow God's way that we make plans to have certain victory on our own regardless of what Jesus is doing or what Jesus would have us to do. And what we see, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem. The crowds around him are looking and expecting victory. They're expecting a miracle. They're expecting for their brackets to be fulfilled. Clearly they know Jesus is going to be victorious. As they wave those palm fronds and they cry out, Hosanna, knowing that God is coming in, knowing that the Messiah is coming. But things look a little peculiar. You see, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem to bring about this certain victory, how does he come? Does he come on a white stallion with a sword and a spear ablazing? No, he comes humble, riding on the colt of a donkey. It's confusing to him. Sure, Zechariah has told us that this is how it's going to come when the Messiah comes into Jerusalem, but at the time, the disciples don't remember that. 
At the time, they're all confused by what Jesus is doing. John tells us this. It says, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. As Jesus came in on this donkey, the next thing that he does is he talks about how he must die and then rise. And all of the crowds, all of the people there that were expecting this miracle begin to kind of question who Jesus is and what actually is he doing. He's riding on a donkey of all animals. How could that be victorious? And by the end of the week, Right? As these crowds don't get what they expect, as the disciples don't see Jesus act as he would expect, as Jesus is pretty much abandoned by his closest followers, as they try to find victory in themselves or they try to find victory in somebody else, those crowds at the beginning of the week were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. By the end of the week, they are shouting, crucify him, crucify him crucify him. And you might ask, how could they abandon him so quickly? How could that change so quickly? But if you think about what the, the crowds that were shouting crucify him, who they were shouting for, they were shouting for Barabbas, this political figure that was fighting for the insurrection. They wanted their victory. When Jesus wasn't giving them what they expected, they went after these other gods. They went after these other figures that they thought could give them that victory. And I think we do the same thing, right? As we live in our faith and life, as our life feels like a busted bracket, it's so tempting for us to go try to find victory somewhere other than Jesus when Jesus doesn't want to act on our terms, when Jesus doesn't give us the miracle that we think we want. But here's the thing. It might look, as Jesus rides in on a donkey, like that victory isn't coming. It might look in life as things seem to be blowing up in our life and we go through suffering and doubt and despair that maybe Jesus isn't actually reigning in victory. But here's the thing. Jesus is bringing victory. Right? Those shouts of Hosanna on Palm Sunday are not in vain. Jesus is giving you and me this victory that's so much greater than we think we even need. It's, it's the victory that we actually need. As Jesus himself goes to the cross and dies for the very people that abandoned him. He goes to the cross and dies for that crowd that is crying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. His love for you is so great that he goes to the cross and dies for you, even though you've given in to your own whims, and he dies for me, even though I'd rather go my own way. And he dies to give you that victory, not just of a political revolution, not just to solve a little medical problem. He gives you that victory that's eternal. That victory that's over sin, death, and the power of the devil. He might not give you the miracle that you want, but he gives you that miracle that you need. So how's your bracket today? Sometimes life feels like that busted bracket. Sometimes life will leave you longing for a victory, trying to solve your own problems, or trying to find somebody who will. Jesus, he has come, he has died for you, he has been raised for you, and he gives you that ultimate victory. That ultimate victory of the resurrection, and in that resurrection, all things are being made right for you. That's the miracle. That's what Holy Week is all about. So go and live under his victory and expect that miracle. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.